great to have you here, Kate. Thanks to be, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, we've got some huge congratulations in order, first and foremost. Maven has closed and announced on Monday its $90 million Series E round. So huge congratulations for that. Thanks. Led uh, by you. Yes. <laughs> we are general catalyst. We are could not be more thrilled to have led this round and partner with you on this journey. And this is a significant investment, not only in this funding climate, but also as a testament to everything you and your team have accomplished. And we're just thrilled. Um, and I'd like to start at the beginning of that journey. You know, we're at Slush, which, which attracts some of the highest potential founders across Europe at the early stage. So for you, when did you know you wanted to start Maven and why, why this idea? So, um First of all, it's so great to be here. I was working in London. Maven started in London um, about eight years ago, and, and I was starting to hear about this conference slush, and it seemed so cool. So eight years later, it's really awesome to be on stage. Um, so I started Maven uh, you know, eight years ago in London because there was a clear gap in care uh, for women and families, not just in the US, but globally, um, You know, when you get on that journey of parenthood. And so I had just kind of entered my 30s, and, um, and I was starting starting to see a lot of stories from my, my friends as they were going through that, that family building journey around infertility, postpartum depression, miscarriage. Um, you know, if you were gay, you didn't have main core, like main fertility benefits through your employer or your, you know, a lot of the, the system wasn't covering kind of, you know, surrogacy and adoption and those pathways to parenthood. And so there was just such an, an incredible need and it was right at the early stages of digital health. And yeah. so all these companies, you know, I was working at this venture capital firm in London, and all of these companies were coming to pitch um, healthcare innovation, and no one was talking about women, and no one was talking about families, and this was such an obvious entry point for, for so much of the healthcare journey. And so I thought, very naively, um, this is something that uh, I, I can definitely do for the next 5, 10, 20 years, and so Maven was born. Beautiful. There's always a bit of naivete in those <laughs> moments. You need it to push yourself forward. And you mentioned, I mean, it's been an eight-year journey. When you reflect back, are there certain major milestones that you believe led you to this moment now? Um, you know, uh, of Maven's success? Yes, exactly. Um, so I would say, you know, working in healthcare, it, you know, you, you, our go-to-market has been B to C to B. So we, we sold to consumer and then we um, went into business. And I know we'll talk about that. Right. But... Um, you know, I think when that first big client really takes a risk on you, um, that's really where, and, and they say, oh, we're going to bring Maven to our population. Um, that's really when I think the, uh, one of the big milestones occurs. And so for us in 2017, so two years after we launched, um, a, a Fortune 50 bank, uh, you know, the global benefits director said, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a chance and bring you on. And we were like 30, 35 people at the time. We're like, oh my God, like, you know, <laughs> Our ACV was like fifty thousand dollars, and awesome. it jumped to you know it was like a huge multi-million dollar contract. Yeah. Um, but that really was an inflection point for us, where not only did our entire team go heads down to operationalize and execute on that contract, and we delivered it. You know, I have an amazing team. We delivered it flawlessly. But also from an venture capital standpoint, you know, Sequoia is one of our amazing investors. I know Doug was just talking. They led our Series B, um, and it was uh, you know Oak. It, which is an amazing healthcare investor, let our series be with them. And so that was also an, an inflection point in the VC community. Got it. And you would, of course, Kevin, your exposure to that at the beginning of your career, you know that quite well. You mentioned yourself, you know, Maven started as a direct-to-consumer business, has since evolved to partner with employers and insurers. Can you walk us through that transition? Because I've, I've heard you say that starting the business with the consumer first has been a key to your success. So maybe you can expand a bit about that. Sure. So, um, because I, I am a patient on the Maven platform, so I have three kids. Um, I, I actually started my pregnancy and parenthood journey with a miscarriage, and then since went to have three pregnancies on Maven. Um, and so, I, in, in some ways, I just wouldn't know how to do it any other way. Um, I think building uh, one of the big things you have to look at when you're a founder, particularly entering a complicated market like healthcare is what's your unique kind of insight and what's your unique competitive advantage. And so, you know, given that women and families have been so underserved for so long, I mean, honestly, my unique insight was like, how do we build a better system, particularly for women? 
Um, and so, uh, and so that's really where, it, you know, we have had a very product focused company um, for a very long time. And so the thinking was, if we can really build a compelling product for consumers, there's probably not going to be as many of them on the platform in the beginning, because this is largely a B2B market from a sales standpoint, if we build, though, an amazing product, that's going to be our competitive advantage when we walk into a benefits team, an employer team, or, or a health plan, and we say, listen, you know, you really should take a bet on us because look at all these engagement metrics, look at all this impact we're having. And so, again, it, it takes a while, and it took a little bit longer. You know, we were mainly, we sold our first uh, benefits contracts in the, uh, six months after we launched, but they were really small. Yeah. And so the first two years, most of our users were consumer, not coming through the enterprise. Yeah. But it was an, uh, we were able to really just continue to hone the product and, and uniquely craft it to their needs. And, and so then by the time the scale started to hit, you know, we had a pretty unique value prop. So we were one of the first companies, we well, the first company to, and this seems so obvious for any women or, or parents sitting in the room, but to bring postpartum and return to work care as part of the core prenatal care model. And that was just, I mean, that's like obvious need that, that members have. Or, yeah. you know, we were the, one of the first companies, uh, actually, no, again, I think the first to, to bring the fertility journey into, you know, and tie it together with the pregnancy journey. And again, that's just so obvious because that's what's happening in real life. But then when we then we went B two B and we talked about that with the buyers, yeah. you know, we had these insights. But then we had the data to prove it from our products. Got it. Because that's an interesting piece actually in the U S. Because there are obviously your benefits managers, your Mercers, your Willis Towers, Watsons that that help companies think strategically about which benefits they should choose. Were you part of that education for why women's and family health should be part of the conversation? And how did you lead some of that dialogue? Oh yeah, I mean we I think we part of the the go to market in the beginning it was very clear we just had to evangelize the problem. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we were I think al always talking about clinical impact and having a clinical strategy early yeah. on is really important. So, we had a lot of doctors and we had a lot of providers saying, you know, this is critical for outcomes, this model is critical. And so we didn't have them yet, but you know, there was like a, we had a a plan around how to get them and then we would survey our early members um, and and kind of tie it to their, their self-reported data in the app to say, look, directionally, this is going in the right direction. So we always had that kind of clinical impact story. And then we just used a lot of patient stories as well to talk about, hey, I had, you know, I had a baby and then I had nothing to support me after that. Or, right. hey, I, I actually really didn't want to go back to work. You know, in the U.S., um, sadly, we, there's no federally mandated uh, paid leave. And so there are some companies in the U.S. where people have to go back to work after six weeks. Now, what we see from our European um, clients, too, is uh, on the other side, you have 12-month leaves, but that also is really, really hard for women to yep. go back after being at home for, for a year. And so there, it, you know, it's on both sides uh, an issue. Um, and so to be able to talk about some of those real patient stories um, really helped evangelize kind of the early days. And so then what, you know, what happens in, in markets, we went from being in a very kind of, we were like the only solution, kind of talking about, you know, this one thing. And then yeah. all of a sudden, all these other companies came into the market, which was great because yeah. they put pressure on the buyer. But then now, you know, the most important thing in a, in a more competitive market like we're in today is it's not, you know, you tell the patient stories, but then bringing it back to the clinical impact and the data um, it, is really where Maven continues to stand apart. Would you say that those are the key differentiating factors when a company or an insurer, anyone says, you know, why should we work with Maven? Is it really the data? Is there anything else that you use to say this when you think about the whole landscape of women's or family health products? Well, it's both the data, but I think for, particularly for employers, employers are looking for breadth. So they, mm -hmm. employers are really busy and they, they don't want just kind of one point solution. They want, you know, if, if they don't want just a fertility benefit. They right. want a whole kind Kind of family care platform. And so I think what, you know, for us too, just following that member and following that consumer in terms of what they want has propelled us in our product roadmap to kind of not just stay in one place. One area. Um, so, you know, in our product roadmap, it's always a trade-off between breadth and depth. Some years we go deep um, to get the clinical data. Other years we go broader. And yep. so, um, so that's kind of, I think, also where Maven stands apart. That's a, that's a perfect segue too to talk just a bit about the platform. You know, when I think about women's and family health broadly, there are so 
so many areas that are underserved, and those are global issues, and we'll talk about that as well. And Maven is already addressing gaps in parenting and pediatrics and fertility and family planning, et cetera. And earlier this year, you launched the first platform for you in, in menopause. How did you decide that menopause was the next product? And, and maybe a bit more broadly, how do you decide which areas to invest in and prioritize? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so actually, menopause originated, a lot of the, de the global demand originated here in Europe. So really? um, in the UK, I think about a year ago, uh, they had a commission, um, the government did, on how menopause shows up in the workplace and how it affects women. And so ever since then, um, a lot of employees at a lot of companies, including our own kind of big multinationals, we're starting to say, okay, if health equity is truly kind of a, a, a value here and DEI is a value, then you know we're investing a ton in fertility and, and family building, but what about menopause? And mm. so, um, so for us, I mean, it's obvious, it, there's a clear need, and because we have so many OBGYNs on our platform, they've always as well asked us. And so we have a client advisory board, and for years we were asking the client advisory board, do you want menopause, do you want menopause? And that, that just wasn't at the top of the list. And then all of a sudden in Q1, we asked our client advisory board, do you want menopause? And they're like, yes. Um, and it was because a lot of this kind of grassroots demand um, that originated in Europe that then made its way back to kind of, you know, big global benefits teams in the, in the US as well. Um, and so, you know, because we're a technology company and we have a set of core capabilities, um, we, we already had the care delivery. So we already had the, the OBGYNs. Right. We have an in-house content team. We have virtual classes. We had all of that. So we quickly packaged that up. Um, we, we built it in four months. And then we actually oh, launched man. it a, a month ago. And we already serve wow. over a million lives. Much of it is global. Um, over 100 of our clients bought it. So it was, it was you know, healthcare doesn't move that fast. So it was, <laughs> it was kind of an, an, amazing, um, an amazing story. And, and we're projecting, you know, m a, a many more clients to adopt it next year. Okay. That's excellent. And you mentioned this is an idea that came from Europe. You're now launching that in the US. But reverse, Maven's actually focusing quite a lot on expanding its presence outside of the U.S. You have members already in over 175 countries. Can you tell us today a bit more about your global strategy? Sure. So global is just also one of those incredible stories where if I, if I look back at our numbers and our pipeline and our user base, um, in 2020, it was still, I, I think a lot of companies were talking about global, but it was still in its nascent stages. Now, um, you know, over 60% of our clients offer Maven globally. We have some of our big kind of Fortune 50 multinationals um, launching Maven globally. They just, or Microsoft just uh, launched us globally, I think, two months ago, which was incredible. Incredible, yeah, and, um, and and just the, the demand and the uptake. I mean, we didn't, you know, it was our first Fortune 50 launching globally, and we didn't know what it was going to look like. But we've since now, we have a bunch more launches in a, in a few months. And I think what we're seeing um, globally is, you know, fertility and family building benefits similar to the U.S. have also been left out of care models, and so it's a complex web of laws where it comes to surrogacy and adoption and IVF. You know, everything's changing all the time. Some IVF is supported publicly, others yeah. people are going to private clinics. Surrogacy is illegal in some, some countries, so yep. there's medical tourism aspects. And so for a lot of big multinationals and, and you know, who want one team across the globe, you know, they can't really say, okay, we're going to help our U.S. employees build families, but not right. our global. So, um, so we have some enormous launches. Um, you know, we've grown 10x globally in the past uh, 24 months, wow. and we're projecting to grow another 10x in the next 12 months. So we're now, you know, we have local care advocates around the world. We're now hiring a local um, sales team on the ground in the UK. Um, but it is just, it's, it's awesome to see. And it's starting with fertility and family building benefits. But, but then the conversation is more broader. Right. It's broader about parents in the workforce and pregnancy and, you know, health, gender equity at work. And some of our clients in Japan, particularly, um, you know, they, they, they're all in on return to work because they're, they're, they're having, you know, big problems around keeping women in the workforce for us and having senior women. So every country is a little bit different, um, but it, it, it definitely, get, you know, it's, it's really, really exciting to see. Core. And, and you started in London. I mean, you mentioned it yourself. You know, you came up with the idea for Maven in London, not far from where we are now. And then you decided to start the company in the U.S. You know, there are lots of founders here who are probably thinking very carefully about where to build their businesses. How did you make that decision at that time? 
Yeah, so I, it's so great to be back here because some of our best friends live in Europe. Um, many of our amazing angel investors are, are European, Brent Hoberman from First Minute. Sure. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we were in London. My husband and I were like, oh, my goodness, um, we love London. Um, however, there were two reasons that we moved. I mean, of course, I'm American, so was able to move very easily from a visa standpoint. But, um, but number one, um, I have three kids today. And so personally, I wanted to, I knew I was going to have kids on this journey and uh, my parents live an hour from me. So my mother is with my children right now and I'm so grateful. And so I think that is so important, particularly of female founders, um, to make sure if you're gonna have kids on this journey that you get that care team around you. Um, yes. So that, uh, you know, I, I miss my kids of course, but they're really happy with their grandparents <laughs> eating more sugar than they've had probably in a month. So, um, so anyway, so that's number one. Number two, I think for all founders, um, you know, you have to look at the TAM. And yep. the TAM is really what allows you, I think, to build big businesses. In the U.S., healthcare is nearly 20% of GDP. Yep. It's a multi-trillion dollar market. And so f it was a pretty obvious thing, you know, if product market fit takes a second, if you're operating in a big TAM, you know, you can kind of figure it out. And so, you know, the, and, and also the, the U.S., um, maybe you've seen that the headlines recently, but, um, you know, Roe v. Wade was just overturned. There's always been, I think, challenges to access to women's health care in the U.S. And so wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we started there. But, you know, we, uh, we signed our first global contracts in 2018, 2019. So actually starting in London has become a big competitive advantage because Excellent. we lean on our investors. We lean on, you know, we, we understand global in a way that um, yep. I think some of our U.S. competitors do not. That's very important. It's something, you know, we're very hands-on with our early stage founders. There's a reason that we're in London and in New York and in Boston and in San Francisco and in Palo Alto. You want to be able to support companies everywhere. And making that decision about when you launch in the U.S. is something that we think about very, very carefully. And, and it sounds like you did the same from quite early on. Um, and bringing you back maybe to your VC roots as well. I mean, you're, you're a very active angel investor. And I know that making time for other women who are building companies is also a huge priority for you, has been for years. What is a frequent piece of advice that you give to early stage founders when they're starting their journey? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, you have to really like what you're doing because it's <laughs> really hard. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, probably a pe my dad's an entrepreneur. Um, okay. And so it's been amazing to have his kind of coaching and guidance along the way. So some of these the nuggets of wisdom are, are his. But one of the things he said really early on, because I think when you're a seed stage founder, you know, everything is just so heavy and the highs are high and the lows are low. And, um, you know, at one point he was like, you know, nothing and no one is ever as good as you think they are, also not as bad as you think they are. And sure. so I think it's, it's um, you know, riding those highs and lows. And I think the other... The other thing that, that, at least in healthcare, has been so important, but I, I would imagine in every industry, you know, I think one of the, the things about being a founder is that your learning curve has to remain high and you have to remain humble because you're constantly being thrown at things, you know, that you've never seen before. And so for us at Maven, um, I, I'm an ex-journalist, actually, uh, and so I have a, a, a huge network of advisors. We have for board independence, which was really important to me wow. across all these different sectors. And so I kind of say it's like my network of sources. Um, and so when I encounter, and it's you know almost every day, there's some new situation, whether it's a go-to-market question or a product question or a financial question or just kind of a, I mean, a management question. We're, you know, over 500 people now. Um, you know, they're, I'm able to ask them and pick up the phone and call them and text them. And so, um, and, and then of course, having an amazing executive team who, who so every decision I make, yeah. um, usually I have inputs from three to four people who are experts in that field. And, and that has helped me from the very early days until, you know, it continues to help me a lot. Maybe we can talk just a bit about team for a minute as well. I mean, you've been so thoughtful about surrounding yourself with extraordinary people, not only from an advisor perspective, but on your executive team and frankly, among the 500 people at Maven. Is there any secret sauce to that? Any thought about building a team, especially a global one with such a significant strategy? Yeah, I mean, the, the questions around team are, are so, um, you know, there's so many these days because we're in this hybrid work environment now. Yep. Um, 
I think though that for us, um, having values is so important, um, and having values that are co-created by your team. And well, so I think some people kind of think, oh, the founder has to create the values, and it's this top-down kind of approach. But for us, you know, yes, kind of, I have a point of view, but I also, you know, we, we just refreshed our values, we refreshed them every two years. I think also hearing from the team, hearing what's most important from them, you know, has has helped inform them. And so, um, and then as you as you kind of have values, to be able to lean on them as well. If you're announcing a tough decision or, or there is an issue, you say, well, you know, a, a value of ours, some of Maven values are embrace the service mindset or you know, continuously learn, keep healthcare human. That's been a Maven value for eight Forever, years. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I th I think that's really important. And then the other thing um, uh, that you know. I, I personally look at is uh, on our executive team, but but also our senior leadership team and like the managers of the company that are really leading, you know, the, the charge on a day to day basis. Um, you know that that incredible growth mindset and humility that they have to have. Like you know, working in healthcare, you have deep expertise in so many people that work in the industry today. Sure. But for them to be successful at Maven, and we've had some stories where they haven't been successful, you have to come in with an open mind, yep. and you have to be able to say, oh, the way I did something here, I might have to do it a little bit differently. And then same from tech, right? We have a lot of people, we have people from the tech side, and you know, when they come in to Maven 2, the way they did in their old company, we want them to come to Maven to teach us that, but then they need to be open to kind of, you know, doing things in a new way because we're, you know, continuing to create a category. And yep. so, um, so anyway, so I think that that growth mindset and humility is something that we even test for in the interview and hiring process. Beautiful. It's, um, I'm smiling because it's something that General Catalyst takes so seriously. We talk about growth mindset all the time um, because our business is changing incredibly quickly as well. I mean, look at this environment that we're in and General Catalyst has been around for over 20 years. So there are many MDs at GC who have seen these cycles and we're able to help our founders think very carefully about it. But anyone in this industry, be it a founder or an operator or a venture investor, has to think very carefully about growth and change and yes. evolution. And you guys have been doing it for a very long time and it's heartening to hear. Um, you mentioned this briefly, you, t you mentioned Roe v. Wade, for example. Um, there are many depressing headlines across the world when it comes to women's and family health. For you, at a 10,000 foot overview, are you hopeful and what do you think it takes for us to actually move women's and family health forward? You know, um, I think founders are always optimistic, right? So um, I am hopeful, actually, because I think that, um, you know, human ingenuity always sees us through. And when bad things happen, I think, you know, Roe v. Wade is just basically an affront to access in healthcare. All the major American medical associations have said this is terrible. Um, you know, nearly one in four women uh, in the U.S. get an abortion by the time they're 45. And you know, sometimes it's for medical reasons, sometimes it's for private reasons. So it truly is just, you know, part of the core care model. And, it, and, and, um, and so I think, though, that in this moment, um, you also, all of the data coming out, the clinical data, the economic data on, on something like this um, is, is very bad, but maybe it's gonna take this to kind of you know, build a better future. And so I, I think I am optimistic because at the highest levels of industry in, um, in America, uh, at least, uh, you know, there are people that are talking about how to change this. So I wish it were being changed tomorrow because people are suffering every single day because of this. But I do think that we're going to get to a, a point where there's going to be consensus um, about, you know, a, a better kind of, you know, system for, for women and families. And, you know, I, w I was just actually reading this essay. Um, it was from the 1950s. Oh, by, wow. By, by Catherine Ann Porter, this great, Excellent. you know, American writer. And it was right after the atomic bomb was dropped. And it was this horrific time when everyone was kind of questioning the future of humanity and like who we are as a species. Right. But I think her, the whole point was like, but then you figure out that you, you figure out your way out of it and, you know, you take a step back and then you go forward. And so I think all the entrepreneurs here in this room um, I, and, and particularly all the entrepreneurs innovating in women's and family health, I think the cat's out of the bag, yep. the door's box has been open and, you know, we together are going to create a much, much better system globally. Beautiful. Beautifully said. Well, thank you for joining us, Kate, for your wisdom, for your candor, and we're energized to see what happens with Maven next.
Thanks, Chloe. Great. We're so thank you to General Callis for leading our last round. We could not be happier. <laughs> so appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you, Thanks, everybody. everybody. <laughs> Great. Yeah.